What's happening guys? So I am currently two days post-op from my uh, hair transplant procedure with uh, Dr. Typhon through Get Hair. So they implanted 3,500 grafts both into the frontal area here and also at the crown as well. So I think they just divided up, it was 1,000 on the crown and then 2,500 along the frontal hairline just through there. So I'll get a little bit closer just so you can get a better view. Okay, so you can see obviously I've still got the bandage and the actual headband over the uh, the top of, uh, of my head here. Um, so they actually recommended that you do this for the first two days following the procedure. Um, and then it's on the, well, actually the fourth day uh, when you actually wash your hair for the first time. So obviously I went back to the clinic the following day after the actual procedure. So the procedure was on Tuesday. Uh, it took about four hours um, and uh, then I went back the following morning for uh, like basically for the uh, bandages to be redressed and then also for them to kind of wash my scalp. Uh, there will be a separate video actually of that uh, quick procedure that I've got my partner to kind of take just so you get a bit of an insight into sort of what it is they do and uh, you know how it kind of feels and looks and all the rest of it. Uh, you get a sort of brief snippet of what it actually looks like at the back of my head and it kind of looked like there's a fair bit of blood obviously uh, which is to be expected. Um, so the bandage itself is not completely covering those areas so if you, if you go in just closely like so you can see a few of the little holes obviously where they had the puncture marks. Um, obviously that's where they extract the hairs from um, and then you know place them into the front of your head. So what I'm going to kind of talk about today to be honest is um, why I chose Get Hair uh, first of all um, and then also what the actual whole experience was like so from start to finish pretty much uh, i'll do little individual snippets on specific things that i wasn't really expecting um and you know even though i've done tons and tons of research watched lots of different people's youtube videos and stuff on you know having their hair transplant procedures there are actually quite a few things that i experienced that i've never actually heard about and uh, not in a negative way just parts of the procedure so obviously my partner and I flew out, uh, we flew out on the Friday, uh, we got picked up at the airport, um, there's a chap there waiting for us just outside the coffee shop, it's all quite straightforward to be honest. Um, he drove us to the hotel, um, hotel was pretty nice, so we stayed in the park inn, which was in the same area as the actual hospital itself that we're having the procedure, that I was having the procedure done. Um, the, uh, the transfer probably took about, say, 40 minutes. It wasn't too long. Um, and the actual, the area where we were staying was quite a small area outside of Istanbul. Um, we did sort of travel in to kind of see some of the sites and stuff like that. And it took us maybe about sort of 30 to 40 minutes. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a bus and a train. Um, it was actually quite a nice thing to do because it, it gave you the opportunity to see a lot of the different parts of the city as well. You, if you stayed bang in the centre, you wouldn't actually see any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, the bus that we got would go over a long bridge and you got an amazing view of the kind of the, the river. And you're obviously very high up at that point and stuff like that too. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite spectacular actually. So on the day of the procedure, um, well actually the day, the day before the procedure, we, uh, we were out and about just having some lunch. Um, and that was when I got all of the information about kind of when I'd be picked up, um, you know, different bits and pieces like that. Um, so they picked me up at 10 past one, uh, which I'll be honest with you, when I, when I got the message, I'd been told initially that, you know, it's going to be between, say, eight and 10 in the morning. Um, and I was a little bit apprehensive. I was like, hang on a minute, it's quite late because obviously I'd heard that they take, say, you know, anything from four to sort of up to eight hours basically to to kind of conduct um and that made me feel a bit like well what's going on why why am i getting picked up because realistically it's not going to start until at least two o'clock um and then you know are they going to be going on till sort of 7 8 p.m in the evening that sounds kind of it sounded a bit sketchy to be put to put it bluntly um to be honest, in hindsight, that was completely unfounded. Um, so the procedure started at bang on two o'clock um, and yeah, it lasted about four hours. So it was pretty much got out of there at like 6 p.m. So on the day of the procedure, um, I actually, well, my partner and I woke up too late for breakfast. Uh, we thought it was till half 10. It turns out it was only till 10. So we got there at like 10 past 10 and they were clearing up, um, which was less than ideal. 
Uh, but fortunately, the hotel did actually kind of go out of their way to provide us with a sort of traditional Turkish breakfast, which is pretty nice of them because they don't really have to do that. Um, obviously, we get getting picked up at like one o'clock. From my perspective, I knew it was going to go on for a long time. So I thought, well, obviously, I eat quite a lot of food normally anyway. Uh, you know, I'm typically going to eat, say, like five, six meals at least a day. Um, and so I was there work thinking, well, I need to have breakfast and lunch. So we had like a fairly small breakfast. Um, and then what I actually did, which I was a bit kind of, I wasn't sure whether it was the right decision to make, to be honest, at the time. Um, but in hindsight, it actually probably was quite a good thing. As, um, believe it or not, there's actually a McDonald's in the area where we were staying. Um, and so I went there with my partner and had like two McDonald's meals. Um, I couldn't eat all of it, but it meant I was really full. And in hindsight, that's probably the best thing that I could have done, just because you don't want to be going there where you're hungry, because you know you are gonna you're gonna lose a little bit of blood and things like that. It's, it's not quite the same as you know a, a conventional operation and stuff, but you know it is still an operation, so you need to be prepared. So we had that, uh, headed back to the hotel, got picked up at about ten past one. It was literally like a five minute drive from the hotel, so we got there about say quarter past 20 past one to the hospital. Um, the hospital itself was, um, I mean, I, I've, I've not really had any experience of private medical care in, in London where I'm from, um, but I really couldn't fault it. It was nice. It was a really nice hospital. Um, it was very clean, very modern. Um, you know, if I went to a hospital like that in London, I'd be, I'd be very happy, you know? Um, so the, the clinic um, for Dr. Typhon is actually on the eighth floor. Um, and so we got the lift up, um, went into the, uh, the little office there, they're obviously expecting us. Um, and then as we were walking in, there was a chap who just kind of finished his procedure. And obviously it was then when it dawned on me that there's only actually two procedures that they do each day. So, you know, you'll have heard lots of kind of stories about uh, different um, clinics and whatnot that are not particularly legit and stuff, and how they're literally just churning them out day in, day out. Uh, and my partner and I actually got speaking to a guy who uh, had his done at another clinic, uh, which is actually one that I was contemplating getting it done at as well. Um, so I can't speak for obviously all of the packages that that clinic had available, but I can only tell you what obviously he told me, um, which was that uh, he got his done through Cosmetica. Um, and I remember um, being contacted by a kind of partner company called Get More Hair, which are like kind of, uh, sort of coordinators for that company. Um, and they had three packages available where they had uh, the kind of sort of deluxe package where you'd actually get it done by their lead surgeon, which is Dr. Akar and his team. And then there was a second option, which is a bit cheaper. And then there was another option below that, which was again, a bit cheaper. Now, I do think that the guy that I spoke to got the cheapest option available, but it did not sound good like it was he basically told me that he was in a room with another person having it done at the same time just with a curtain between them um and that you know he was in and out of there in like two and a half hours which is i mean i thought mine was quick with four um because you know they were very very efficient when they were doing my one so if i if it had been literally almost half that amount of time i'd have been very worried you know um you know that's not to say that he might not get a good result he might but the, the setup doesn't really bode well, you know? Um, if I turned up and it had been like in an environment like that, I'd have probably not actually had it done. I'd have pro I'd probably turned around and said, actually, do you know what? This is not what I was expecting. This is not really up to scratch. I'm not really prepared to, to risk my health basically because you want to get me in and out of here and take my money as quickly as possible. Um, furthermore, he actually told me that there were people at that clinic having them done up until like 10 o'clock at night which again, it's just, that's, that's gonna send alarm bells ringing, if, you know, when you hear that. Anyway, that aside, um, back to obviously the experience that I personally had. Um, so like I said, I had the consultation, which again, I've got a separate video for that, which my partner kindly filmed. Um, you know, it gives an insight into, you know, how Do Dr. Typhon, um, you know, goes about his process, you know, how he analyzes your hairline and all the rest of it. You know, I came prepared. Um, I gave him like a, a kind of detailed overview of what my hair looked like, you know, when there was no experience of hair loss, right up to the point where I was today. Um, so he had a good insight. And I think that's quite important as well, because that's gonna allow him to achieve the most natural look for you, uh, compared to what you would look like if you'd not experienced hair loss, basically, right? 
So we went through all of that, obviously did the payment. Um, so I personally paid £3,200. Um, they gave me the option of uh, paying in cash uh, and they gave me a very small discount for doing so. So, you know, from my perspective, it was a bit of a no-brainer really. I just went to the bank, withdrew the money and got a little bit of money off, you know. There was no issues with kind of traveling with the money or anything like that as well, just in case that's what you might be thinking. Um, so once that was all done, uh, they took me into a side room. Um, I did actually ask if my partner could film parts of the procedure, but you know, obviously it's a sterile environment, so you know you can't have anyone in there that's basically, uh, you know, not a surgeon or not the technicians or, or anything like that that's going to kind of get in the way. Um, and so yeah, obviously that's not really uh, was kind of out of the question, which I understood that. That's fair enough, you know. Um, so yeah, they they took me into a little side room. Uh, they shaved my head um, down to like a zero basically uh, and that was quite a bizarre experience. Um, <laughs> I went to the bathroom obviously just before I had the procedure and obviously I saw my partner and she was sort of looking at me like oh my god what the hell's happened um, and I went to the bathroom too and looked in the mirror and I was like wow if that is not a confirmation that this isn't the right thing to do then I don't know what is because I don't suit having a shaved head. <laughs> um, anyway, so once that was done, uh, I was taken into the, the actual operating room. Uh, so the room was very nice, man. It was really big. Um, it was, like I said, it was on the eighth floor. So uh, there were three large windows within the actual room itself. Um, and, you know, obviously it was a really lovely day as well. So like, so there was a bit of sunlight coming in and stuff, which is really nice. Um, you know, before the procedure, they gave me uh, an antibiotic and also, or the first anti, first pill of a course of antibiotics, um, and then also a small pill of Valium, which is bizarre because I didn't really think it did that much, but in hindsight, actually, it was you know I was probably talking a lot of rubbish basically um, to, to both the surgeon and then the coordinator as well, um, and so it just makes you feel really relaxed. Um, that's the only way I can describe it. Um, you're, you're perfectly aware of everything that's going on um, and you're not kind of, uh, you're not in some sort of trance or like a zombie or something, um, but it just does make you very relaxed um, and it has more of an effect than you might think. Um, so once that was done, like I said, I went into the actual surgery room, they gave me a gown to put on um, and they got started. So the first thing that they did was obviously um, apply the local anesthetic along the hairline at the top here um, and what they actually did at the clinic that I went to which I wasn't even expecting was they had like a pain blocker so I already knew I'm not very good with pain and basically what they did was uh, I didn't actually see the implement but what it basically did is it kind of directed your attention elsewhere when they were doing the injections and so it was like a small vibrating device that would be placed on your skin so say you're getting you know an injection here it would be here and it'd be just there like uh, buzzing your skin and they go pinch like that and then they'd move it somewhere else and go pinch and they'd do that all around just the frontal area of your head to start and I've got to be honest man I mean it was far 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 less painful than I was expecting because that was, that was the part that I was most worried about you know um, I'm not particularly great with needles I think the last time I had a blood test I literally passed out um, like fully passed out and so I was sort of a bit I was a bit apprehensive really to be honest that being said, that was fine. Um, you know, they pl they put me on a drip as well, so they put a, a little kind of cannula in the uh, in the forearm, just at the top of the elbow here, um, and they took a small blood test, uh, which I think they later use for the PRP therapy when they separate the platelet-rich plasma, and obviously they re-inject that at the end of the procedure and stuff. Um, and then I was on a drip the entire time, which uh, you know is like a, a nutrient-dense solution that they kind of just give you to kind of get you through it, basically. So I had that, um, and then, like I said, the uh, the surgeon himself was doing all of the incisions. So the sur only the surgeon did the incisions, um, which you know for me is a big thing because you know ultimately that's going to dictate what your hair looks like. You know the technicians are very skilled, but ultimately their their role is really just to to extract the hairs and then place them. Um, that doesn't dictate how your hair looks afterwards. What dictates how your hair looks is the way in which the incisions have been cut and the angle at which they've been cut. So the surgeon prior to um, you know the procedure, obviously in the consultation, had identified that at the middle portion of the frontal hairline here, my hair was at about 40 degree angle. And so he actually mapped that through when he was making the incisions. 
and obviously it's, you know I can't tell exactly right now um, but you know I trust his judgment that he he kind of identified that without any sort of prompting whatsoever which gives you a sort of an indication of the level of skill that he's working with so like I said the uh, the surgeon did the actual, actual incisions themselves um, it was a weird feeling so the, the the thing I touched on earlier that I was talking about which I hadn't really come across in other people's videos was um, basically the sounds. So it goes about saying that obviously with it being on your, you know, on your scalp and stuff, it's very close to your ears. So you actually are gonna hear a lot of what's going on. You can't feel it, you know, your head is completely numb, but you can hear the, hear the sounds. And I'm not really the best uh, um, at kind of dealing with that. Um, and like, so if I'd probably known about that before and I was expecting it, I'd have been anxious about it. Um, but yeah, like just to kind of give you an insight, basically when the surgeon was making the very small incisions at the top of your head, the only way I can describe it is it's basically the, the sound each one makes, it's like a cracking sound. And it's a bit like when you yawn and your ears crack. And it's like that every time, every single time that he makes a small incision. Um, it's over very quickly, that's all I'll say. You know, it's not something that's gonna kind of deter you. And I was openly talking to the surgeon whilst he was doing it, so it wasn't sort of, uh, something which is making me feel like queasy or anything like that really uh, that's partly to do with the Valium I reckon probably as well um, once the surgeon had done the incisions uh, obviously the next process was to extract the hairs so they'd flip you on your side and then they'd start administering the local anaesthetic through the sort of portion of the side of your head here and then round the back as well and what I kind of noticed even partly from at the front here as well is that you'll probably have one side of your scalp that's more sensitive than the other. So for me personally, my left side of my scalp was actually a lot more sensitive. So when they were placing the, the local anesthetic injections into that area, it was a little bit more painful on one side more than the other. Um, but the, the thing is that once they've done a few of them, obviously it starts to work. So it's less, less of a painful feeling for the other injections that they do. Um, that being said, um, the local anesthetic at the back of your head is definitely a lot more uh, painful than at the front of your head. Front's very straightforward to be honest, which I wasn't expecting because I was thinking there's not much skin there and stuff. It's quite, you know, it's, it's quite a dense area basically, right? Um, so yeah, when you get to the back of your head, you know, as you just felt like the, the nape sort of around the top of your neck here is quite sensitive. But strangely, I'd say the most sensitive thing that I felt was at the top in the middle here. So on the side of your head there, when they do the uh, local anesthetic there, it is really painful. <laughs> um, it's not, it's not a sort of, um, it's not a pleasant feeling whatsoever, really. Um, so obviously they did, they, they, you know, they numbed the back of my scalp down here, um, and then they turned me on my side, started doing a few extractions, then turned me on my front, did some more extractions. Um, and then obviously uh, they just get you to tilt your head to the side like that and then they do the final area on the other side around here too. Um, once they'd done that, obviously, you know, this, I had the surgeon and three technicians all working on me. That is, that's a lot of manpower, you know. Um, in a lot of the other cheaper clinics, you just get two technicians. And so, you know, the, that will impact how quickly the procedure's being done. And also, you know, the, the level of fatigue that each person is gonna experience as well. So, you know, if you think about it realistically, if you're concentrating on something so minute and so detailed for a long period of time, you are going to get tired. And, you know, although these people do it day in, day out, you are going to be tired from doing that, you know. So if you can spread the workload over more people, then, you know, arguably you're going to end up with a better result as the patient, you know. So once they'd done obviously all of that, then we went on to the actual implantation part of the procedure. So uh, for that part, I was just basically lying flat on my back um, and I literally didn't even feel a, a single thing on the crown area. I, I honestly didn't even know they'd done it. Like it was bizarre, but I did feel it a little bit around obviously the front here and stuff like that when they were implanting the hairs. Um, throughout the procedure, I didn't see any blood at all. They were quite sort of, um, uh, they're probably very aware that people aren't really that keen to see blood basically you know uh, there's only one point where basically i was on my front looking down through what's a bit like a massage chair with your face it's like a kind of rim around your face and i can see one of the tissues which obviously when you know when they're making the extractions and stuff they, they extract wipe extract wipe 
um, and basically I could see, yeah, like I said, a, a small bit of blood on one of those tissues. So I just closed my eyes. Um, and then like a, a moment later, the lady had taken away anyway and stuff and they're using a different one. Um, so yeah, like I said, the procedure took about four hours. Um, the, the kind of things that I wasn't expecting as much were, like I said, the sounds. So, you know, reiterating like the kind of cracking sound on the front of your head here. And then when they're using the small little uh, extraction tool, the kind of motorized uh, extraction tool at the back of your head, um, it, it does f feel and sound like a miniature drill. Uh, it's, it's weird because, you know, I was listening to music through just sort of like one headphone just to kind of blur out a bit of the noise and stuff. Um, but you can hear it. And even now, um, I, can, I remember the sound very vividly. And at the time it didn't bother me, but afterwards it was a little bit, uh, it made me feel a bit kind of queasy when I think about it. Um, like when you wince a little bit, you know? Um, but aside from that, it's, it's very minor really. And you know, it's only like I said, so I had it on Tuesday, it's currently Friday. Um, I, I've forgotten about it already, to be honest. It was maybe only a day or two after that, I actually kind of felt like that. Um, so yeah, like at the end of, end of the procedure, uh, they get you to sit up. Um, what I personally found um, was that I actually sat up and I started to feel a bit lightheaded. So it was all dealt with very, very quickly. Um, they basically lay me flat on my back. I had, like I said, two of the uh, technician nurses raising my legs up. Uh, they put another IV drip in because the bag kind of depleted. Um, and then they took my blood pressure and it was all fine. Uh, there was no issues whatsoever. Um, and like within a minute or so I felt a lot better. I think it to be honest It was partly just from being lying horizontal for such a long period of time um, I think if you did that and you sat up quite quickly anyway, you would maybe feel a bit lightheaded if you even if you hadn't anything done, you know um, So at the end of the procedure they gave me something to eat So they gave me just basically a small carton of fruit juice. So obviously for the sugar um, and they gave me like a little small sandwich which had some feta and Kind of vegetables in it and stuff like cucumber and peppers and stuff uh, so I ate that because, to be honest, I was kind of hungry at the time. Um, and uh, that was kind of it, really. They dressed up, obviously, you know, the bandage and stuff. Uh, they didn't initially put the black headband on. So the black headband actually was given to me the following day. Um, and so the black... Uh, so, yeah, so what they had actually done is they, they had the dressing here. Uh, and if I just move that a tiny bit, you can see that white little line. So what that basically is, is basically... Um, it's kind of dressing tissue that they have uh, twisted and they placed it along your uh, the kind of midpoint of your forehead here and obviously that's just to stop the swelling dropping so the swellings come down a little bit and um, so you can kind of see it just up at that top section there and um, it has come down a little bit from what it was like when obviously the, you know the day after the actual operation uh, but you can kind of still see it there my head wouldn't normally be this puffy and stuff uh, and the reason they put that is just basically to stop it dropping. So if you didn't wear this at all, the whole of your face would swell up. Uh, and that's purely from the local anaesthetic. So the local anaesthetic uh, causes that response, basically. Um, but yeah, so like I said, had a sandwich. Um, they, they kind of um, took me to the, the lobby and everything. My driver was sort of waiting for me there. Um, and what was quite reassuring as well is that basically um, my partner and I actually left the hospital with all of the staff you know so you, you knew full well they'd had one patient in the morning and they had me in the afternoon and that's it they're not doing it anymore they're not doing it with anyone else they're not seeing like 10 patients a day or something um, and from my perspective I think that that's that's quite reassuring you know because there's nothing worse than you turning up something I think people sort of refer to them as um, hair mills and stuff but you know turning up and you are literally just churning them out like number after number um, because you know the level of care you get when you're having the procedure done and also the level of aftercare is going to be pretty piss poor in my opinion